this is a Center for Missional Outreach call focused on uh, missional uh, response grants. And we're eager to share with you a little bit about the intention behind these grants, how they'll work, um, and uh, provide opportunity for some brainstorming and definitely some, some Q&A for all of you. So hopefully at the end of this call, you'll feel equipped to, uh, to apply for these. And I hope that they are a, a catalyst and an encouragement to you and your ministry and your communities. So uh, before we get too far into it, um, let me offer a brief word of scripture and a prayer for us. I was uh, thinking a little bit about some of the messaging that uh, I continue to see just in, in the news media and um, all across our communities, expressing the idea that um, as we move through this pandemic, that we're in it together, that we're in this together. And it reminded me of wise words from the prophet Isaiah that also expressed in a different way how we are all interconnected. And so I want to share with you these words from Isaiah 58. I'll read a few verses from, chapter, from verses 9, 10, and 11. So I heard these words. The prophet says, if you remove the yoke from among you, the finger pointing, the wicked speech, if you open your heart to the hungry and provide abundantly for those who are afflicted, your light will shine in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noon. The Lord will continually, uh, will guide you continually and provide for you, even in parched places. He will rescue your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. They will rebuild ancient ruins on your account. The foundations of your generation's past you will restore. You will be called mender of broken walls, restorer of livable streets. Will you pray with me as we begin? Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for your steady companionship through these days in which the foundations do seem to be shaking. And God, we find solace and encouragement in the truth that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, open our eyes to the needs of the oppressed and the afflicted around us and all of our communities. Help us to recognize the timeless wisdom that we find in your words, that our fortunes are tied up with theirs, and that the way in which we reach out to them and are in ministry with them in so many ways opens the floodgates to your grace and your mercy and your strength in our own lives. Help us this day to rest in your presence, to rely upon your grace so that we are indeed a spring that never runs dry and a light to all the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, so as we begin this uh, Center for Missional Outreach call, uh, I do want to just remind all of you of a couple of other calls that our various centers um, are also sponsoring this week. Uh, tomorrow, on Tuesday at 1 o'clock, uh, Cami Gaston and I, uh, in particular, will be leading a book on adaptive leadership and, um, and how to uh, thrive and, and survive leading churches through this time of change. We'll be using Canoeing the Mountains as our primary resource and be in touch with that, do a little teaching, do a little uh, uh, learning from one another and conversation. Um, you can register ahead of time for that. And there's a, work, a workbook that we're utilizing um, to guide us through that work. So that's tomorrow at one o'clock. And then on Thursday at 1.30, uh, the Center for Church Development will be leading a webinar on Tech Talk with North Texas Conference Geeks. Um, experts will be on the call to answer questions about hardware, software, subscription services, 
and some of the little things that you can do that'll make a big difference in your ministries as we all continue to uh, adapt and learn. So I just wanna put those uh, on your radar. But we're here today to talk about uh, the COVID-19 missional response grants. Let me say just a word about um, sort of where these grants come from, where this uh, idea for grants comes from. For uh, some time now, uh, all of the centers, we've been focused uh, on a strategy that, um, that has us playing a role as catalysts for local churches. So that rather than the conference in this time trying to develop our own uh, programming, um, our own response, uh, our focus is on uh, being a resource and a support and an encouragement to you um, who are truly uh, on the ground and on the front lines in a unique way uh, to develop your own responses. And so these grants are just in, offered in that spirit uh, to be a way to catalyze your own work in your own communities. Uh, for these grants, the, the money is coming from a disaster, the North Texas Disaster Relief Fund. If you're not real familiar with that fund, um, over the years, uh, folks from across the North Texas Conference have given to this designated fund, and uh, it's used to power uh, the church's response in, in the wake of disasters. So in October, when the tornadoes uh, hit parts of Dallas, uh, dollars from this fund were used uh, to help our response and to uh, meet some of the needs of, of families, especially in the Christ Foundry area. Uh, whose homes were uh, were damaged. Uh, before that, a lot of these funds were given for and then used uh, to aid our response to Hurricane Harvey. And so uh, these dollars have been used to subsidize dozens and dozens of uh, mission teams from across the conference to go south and be a part of the rebuilding efforts. They were used to rebuild a house, roo or a roof on a church um, in Portland, Texas, when the insurance uh, didn't cover all of the costs required to replace that. Um, and, and many other kinds of efforts related to Hurricane Harvey recovery. Well, there are funds that are uh, remaining in this North Texas Disaster Relief Fund. And, and so our, our CMO team discerned that it would be uh, timely and that it would be helpful for us to repurpose some of those dollars um, to bring some aid in this crisis and in the midst of this disaster that we're in the midst of. So um, we're doing that in a variety of ways. We certainly uh, recognize that, uh, as I'm sure many of us have seen uh, reported uh, pretty steadily in the news, that uh, persons of color are uh, being affected by COVID-19, both health-wise and economically, in a disproportionate way. And so with that lens, uh, we have engaged in conversation with, uh, with the various leaders of our Latinx churches in and around Dallas and are working on developing some uh, responses with them, uh, specifically around food distribution and mental health and counseling services. That's one example. Um, hopefully you've heard that uh, tomorrow is North Texas Giving Day now. And uh, granted, this is an effort focused on, um, on the city of Dallas and surrounding communities, um, but we saw that we could uh, engage in a meaningful way by uh, strengthening the work of those various nonprofits who really are on the front lines and meeting the needs um, of persons who are most affected, again, in many cases, uh, in communities of color. And so uh, we're matching gifts given tomorrow on North, uh, North Texas Giving Day now. And hopefully you've seen communication about that. If you have questions, I can answer those at another time. Um, and then there are these grants, again, that are being funded from the North Texas Disaster Relief Fund and a way for us to drive resources to um, our metropolitan areas where we know that many of the churches have ongoing relationships uh, with people and communities that are have been most affected. And, and uniquely, um, for these grants also um, to rural communities. Um, and we want to have, especially in our focus, uh, churches that um, are 150 in worship uh, or smaller, who uh, we know are integral to your communities and who are very well aware of um, 
the different kinds of needs that are emerging and may just benefit from some additional resourcing in order to make your hopes and your dreams about connecting with your, your neighbors uh, happen. So anyway, that's a little bit about uh, where these grants come from um, and our hope for them. So let's see, that's probably enough for now. Let me, um, Andrew, let me pitch it to you and you wanna give us a little more detail about these two types of grants. Andrew, you're muted. Yeah, Andrew, you're still muted. Sorry, I've got a toddler over here, so we may need our own disaster response help over here. Um, so we've got uh, two real grant opportunities. Oh, goodness. Two real uh, grant types. One is called a racial equity response grant. Uh, and that is really purposed to try to amplify the efforts of some of our churches uh, that primarily serve in settings that allow them to make positive impacts in uh, black, um, indigenous, and person of color communities. And um, these grants can go toward relief type efforts. Uh, so, you know, thinking about immediate needs of our surrounding communities, food insecurity is a big one right now, of course. Uh, and several of you have, have lifted that up in, in previous conversations. Um, and a number of other things are, are, are brewing and y'all have great ideas already. Um, other uh, more long-term advocacy related um, ministries are also kind of on the table for that grant. Um, our rural response grant is really to try to focus on um, our rural churches uh, with under 150 in average worship attendance. They're in a position to make impacts in their community. Um, and so we've got two real funding options, just to be real practical. Um, we can either have um, just a direct grant, and those are um, in the range of 250 to $1,000. So they're, they're on the smaller end. Um, and then we can do a matching challenge grant, which uh, we can offer a little bit more. Um, and those are in the range of 500 to 2,500. So for every dollar that a church can raise uh, for, you know, whatever this project and idea is that you have, we will match it dollar for dollar. Um, and again, we're, we're going to try to limit this to uh, congregations under, under 150 in attendance so that we can really um, try to partner with our churches that uh, may be impacted more than others by um, uh, the recession. Andy, would you like to speak about our priority? Yeah, and so I alluded to this earlier, but let me just say this in another way. Um, you know, for the Center for Missional Outreach, one of our um, focus areas has to do with um, racial justice and equity um, as, a, as a center team. And with all the work we do, uh, we try to um, spark conversation and awareness around uh, the realities of uh, racism and to help all of us view our work through that lens rather than maybe compartmentalize it to help us see um, all the work we do uh, through that lens. And we, are deeply convicted um, by the idea that if we do that, that that's you know a small part of um, of the mix of what will help us to become a more just and equitable church and community, and so and so I just offer that to you um, related to these grants as well, um, especially as I'm looking at some of our rural church leaders. Um, you all know your context and your communities well. Uh, you all know what um, relationships and what community partners uh, uh, you already are connected to. Um, and so, you know, you all uh, can see the opportunities that you have uh, to come alongside your neighbors effectively in this moment. Um, what I would uh, encourage you to do and challenge you to do is to, again, to 
if you've not already done so, to view all of what I've just said, your community, the needs, relationships, partners through that lens of racial justice and equity. And just know that um, as we receive these uh, grant requests, um, you know, we'll uh, have that lens in mind as well and, and be particularly eager uh, to fund and support um, efforts that clearly uh, have, that, have that theme of work in mind. So just to be super clear, if you're in a particular community uh, where um, the need you see and the opportunity that you have doesn't uh, obviously sort of directly connect with communities of color, that doesn't disqualify you. I don't mean to imply that, but we are just again trying to uh, help all of us grow in this way and uh, to have this important lens in mind as we do our work with our neighbors. So. And a word about uh, deadlines. We have a rolling deadline um, uh, for this grant application. Uh, so we're looking to see kind of how um, how these are taken advantage of and, and how these grant applications come in. And so we're um, kind of waiting to see what the response is before we put a, a hard and fast deadline on those. And uh, hopefully when we you know, are able to receive applications from you uh, we, and others, we can uh, have a very quick turnaround, especially for those grant applications that um, uh, are very pressing in terms of timelines uh, for the work that you want to do. Um, and we want to really be clear, um, if you've never put a grant application together, uh, if that, you know, terminology is just really throwing you off and, and intimidating, we don't want you to be worried at all. If it takes uh, me helping you just write the application your, uh, myself, we can do that. Um, I can help you you know, think through the ideas that you have, even if it's just a really basic idea, uh, kind of coach you through that. We want to be this, uh, help this be as easy as possible for you to be able to do the most good uh, in your communities. So we want to make it as easy as possible. All right, friends. So, I mean, that hopefully we've um, set the table for some further conversation around these grants, either the racial equity grants or the uh, rural missional response grants. So at this point, are there any particular uh, questions that you have, again, either about the, the intent of the grants or just the process of application? Um, so Andy, good morning. Yes, good morning. I have one, two questions. One, uh, so Andrew, you gave the amount uh, between 250 and 1,000 for the rural churches. Uh, what is the amount for the racial ethnic churches? What is the amount for the grant? Is it the same? Uh, yes, so they're both the same. Uh, you can have two funding options. So one, you can get a direct grant where um, it's just a, it's a check in the mail. It's 250 to $1,000. Mm -hmm. Uh, or you can get a matching challenge grant, which is uh, worth more of 500 to 2,500. Um, but for that, you've got to raise sure. uh, money from other sources as well, but you can potentially have more of an impact. My second question is, is the grant application on the CMO website? Uh, yes, it should be active now. Okay. If you go to, um, the Center for Missional Outreach uh, subpage on our website. Uh, they should be active now and can receive applications. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. In fact, I just navigated to the Missional Outreach page, and both grant applications are up and uh, ready to be filled out. Any other uh, questions, again, just about uh, grant application process or, again, the intention uh, behind these grants? So, yeah, I'm going to ask if I could. Um, the difference between the two, um, they're both seeking the same results of, of uh, supporting communities through this. 
One is intentionally partnering um, where in my community, um, there's, there's not a, a direct ministry in our community, uh, not a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, varying ethnicities within my community, but we could expand ours to reach um, with maybe partner with a, a church in, a, in the next county over or something like that to, to build a relationship in the midst of that. Or we could work within the community that we've got. That would be the, the defining difference between the two. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's fair. Again, in your context, um, I think that the, our hope is that the, the nature of these grants would encourage you to even ask those questions that I sort of heard um, you working through. Um, are there um, uh, communities of, of color in your community or surrounding areas that are, that are being affected um, that you could potentially reach out to? Um, even just, again, looking at your situation using that lens and asking that question um, is is a positive thing um, having done that if if it seems as though the way that you and your church can be most effective to be in ministry with your neighbors right now um, doesn't it doesn't necessarily um, lead you into ministries with communities of color then again that that doesn't disqualify you from applying does that make sense uh, again you, we want these efforts that you all develop to to be a contextual for you. Right. Well, I, I, just like you said, I think the search for that need um, will, will open eyes um, and, and have us look closer at the community and hopefully our members to look closer in the community um, beyond what they just see um, face to face. So thanks. Yeah. Andy, I have a question. Great. Um, does does the does this need to be a new ministry? I was thinking about uh, possible collaboration with the school district and food distribution, and so um, and also we we had hungry hearts in summers prior to the summers, but I don't know what this summer might look like, given the COVID outbreak. So I think my question is just basically: Does this need to be like a new new ministry, or can this fund existing ministries either done by the church already or done by the church in the community or just community yeah uh, i would well, my response to that would be that uh the dollars could do not have to be used to start something brand new uh again i think the spirit of the grants is to um, aid your church's response to needs that are that are emerging because of the COVID-19 pandemic um, or, or you know, needs that have become heightened like food insecurity uh, because of the pandemic. So you know, you're, as, as I hear your question, Sylvia, I mean, you may have been a part of a, a partnership that had addressed food insecurity in the past, um, but if your community is like many of those that I've become familiar with, uh, you know, you may be seeing need that's doubled or tripled in these in this time, and so um, and so a grant could be used to lean even more into that kind of ministry, in order to meet the changing needs. So, again, I think I think that the, the clear focus we want to have for all these grants is that they are um, they're they're helping you be in ministry with your neighbors uh, to meet needs that are emerging because of the pandemic. Thank you. Andrew, do you want to add anything to that? I think you captured it well. Uh, yeah, uh, Jay, see, is it your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. My, my wife teaches fourth grade online now, and it's a uh, it's crazy if they don't raise their hand. So I'm just. <laughs> That's um, good. Can you can you all um, just give some examples of uh, some of what these grants might go to for in rural churches with less than 150? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Andrew, I'll take a stab, and then if 
if you want to follow up and offer some others as well. Um, so, I mean, and largely, I'm just going to be reflecting back to you um, ideas for ministries that um, that I've learned about and and seen emerging um, from some uh, some churches across the conference. So, uh, so for example, if you have um, any kind of uh, hospital or healthcare clinic um, or healthcare personnel in your community, um, you know, a church could develop a, a special outreach, uh, a ministry of support and encouragement for those uh, frontline persons. Similarly, you know, most every community has some kind of a, a grocery store. I know not all, but most. And, and so along the same lines, you know, a ministry of encouragement um, and support could be developed for those essential workers. Um, uh, any, you know, Andrew already lifted it up, but food insecurity is, uh, is, is a pressing need that cuts across every demographic and community in these days. Uh, again, some of the, the nonprofits I'm closest to are reporting having, uh, you know, feeding 250, 300% of the, the typical numbers of persons that, um, that they feed. And so any way that your church can connect to those efforts in your community uh, to be a part of food distribution, I think that would be um, an opportunity. Um, you know, in your community, you may be aware of a particular um, industry. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, a Tyson Foods plant that's in your county or, uh, I mean, you know, you name it, but some particular industry that really is a part of the economy in your local community that um, has had to furlough workers or has been shuttered for the past two months. And, uh, and so you may be aware of an, a particular opportunity to partner with that, um, you know, with, with the community of workers um, and, and uh, know what they're experiencing and how you can be helpful to them. Um, we're aware that uh, mental health needs, we're probably just seeing uh, the tip of the iceberg right now in terms of uh, the mental health needs that will be emerging. And even as um, people are, sort of released from sheltering in place, many of them will emerge, maybe not um, as well off as they were when they entered into that sheltering time. And so, um, so I mean, there may be a way for you to partner with um, a mental health provider in your community uh, to amplify their efforts, to uh, help connect people to them and the work they do, even just to raise awareness um, that um, if you're experiencing X, Y, or Z, you know, uh, um, you're not alone and there are resources. Anyway, so trying to step into that mental health arena, uh, we see as a really legitimate way to respond to needs. And I guess, I mean, one more I'd lift up that's an uh, obvious one for me is um, partnering with your local schools. Um, I mean, in most every case, you know, our school districts have been... Um, um, well, on the front lines of meeting food insecurity needs for children and families, um, they've also been adapting themselves, and teachers and administrators have been uh, working double time to try to learn new skills, just like so many of you. And so I think there's a great opportunity uh, if, you know, to develop a relationship, or if you have, already have one, to connect with um, school principals or even just teachers in your community that you have a, a relationship with and simply ask the question, you know, how can our church community be helpful to you right now? Uh, what do you need? Um, and, and begin conversations like that. Uh, I think we've seen that, that those relationships with schools uh, have uncovered a lot of opportunities for ministry. Um, and I guess while, while I've rattled those kinds of ideas off, uh, let me just give you a little um, shameless plug now uh, that uh, our center has plans in the works for uh, the next couple of weeks to have focused calls on two of those topics. One is on uh, mental health and again, uh, bringing experts on to help us step into those waters and see how churches can uh, be a part of addressing needs. Again, that I think are gonna be mm -hmm. Um, going to be rising and important for the next 
six months. Um, you know, this is not going to end just when business is open. Um, and then the other is on, on church school partnerships. Um, we'll again bring expert practitioners to the table and have good conversation about um, what we're learning about the best ways we can partner with our friends in the education sector. So, and again, they're going to be adapting for the rest of this year too. So lots of opportunities to be um, in ministry with our neighbors in those ways. So those calls are uh, over the next couple of weeks. You'll see more about that. So, uh, Sonia, hold your question for just one second. Um, Andrew, I just want to, do you want to follow up or, and add any other um, just sort of examples as a way to um, spark some thinking about this? Uh, you know, we might just think a little bit more about, um, that was pretty comprehensive um, description. With the racial equity grants, um, all of those components are included, uh, but you might also think about kind of the advocacy piece of uh, ways to draw attention of local leaders, of um, legislative leaders, um, and others um, to the needs of communities of color uh, and others that um, have not gotten the attention uh, that they need uh, as this uh, pandemic continues to work itself out. Um, and to draw resources to those communities that, that are being so hard hit. Um, so that's the only component I would add. Great. All right, yeah, uh, Sonia. Yes, uh, this um, actually uh, goes back to Sylvia's question. So in our particular context, we already had a partnership with the school where the church every year provided backpacks and school supplies in August. Uh, and just to give a little context, the church I am at, we average 50 people on a Sunday morning. So that gives you our size, and yet they do amazing things. So last August, 113 backpacks full of supplies were given out uh, to area children in need. Um, so it is anticipated there are going to be more applications this year. There is going to be a greater need because of the pandemic and the, uh, the parents out of work or the income has been reduced. And so my understanding is the, um, the grant could be used for that because it's it's a pre-existing ministry, but there will be a greater need. Um, so if that if I'm correct about that, but also uh, where conversations have just started last week in our church. Um, is that we already have a partnership with the food pantry. Uh, I'm going to brag on the church for a minute. Uh, we Every other week, we have a one-hour food drive in our parking lot. We had one yesterday. We have now collected 3,500 items since March uh, to go to the food pantry. So uh, we, I love that that's been happening. Now we're starting to look at, we have, a, we have acreage. Uh, if we look at our resources and our abundance at the church, we have acreage that's not being used. And part of that was turned uh, years ago into community garden beds for uh, community people to pay a water fee and they could come garden. Well, there's only a handful of families using those now. It's not as popular as it used to be. And we are trying to get that uh, restarted in the community. And we do have some more um, uh, uh, people who are interested in these days with a little bit more time on their hands. And there seems to be an uptick now in uh, looking at, again, uh, being able to grow our own food. But we're looking at all the unused beds and thinking, is there a way that we could use those to grow uh, fresh produce to help meet the nutrient needs in the community to somehow keep partnering with the food pantry to grow fresh vegetables that could be, then be distributed through the local food pantry. But I know that's a, putting a sy system into place and you need refrigeration or whatever else you need. So we're starting to look at going in that direction, but it, it, we're in the very beginning stages of looking at that. So is that my understanding, either or of those, um, in theory, the grant could be applied towards, but would there be a priority such as the community beds and producing um, fresh foods uh, over the backpack ministry? So Sonia, thanks so much. Um, I don't know if I would, I mean, just off the cuff, want to sort of rank those. I think they both could be legitimate uh, grant requests. 
but I may say one word about each and then and Andrew again if you have comment please add something um, so first is related to um, sort of revisiting uh, the community garden work and thinking about how that could be particularly relevant these days um, I think that's a fantastic idea and there's somebody on the call that you definitely should talk to and that's Samantha Parson um, uh, Samantha and her church uh, just recently received a ministry with grant to uh, begin a pretty substantial um, a community garden effort uh, themselves in their context uh, with a lot of the same kind of goals and so y'all probably want to talk to each other um, mm -hmm. so so definitely I would encourage you to think about that and uh, I mean whether it's in a, an urban context or rural context I mean, we're definitely hearing that uh, food pantries uh, are in need of supply and and particularly in need of you know of produce um, and so if the church could be a part of that broader system in your community that would be fantastic um, related to the, the backpacks I guess uh, definitely if there's an expanded need and a grant could help you rise to meet that expanded need I think that would be legitimate um, the one uh, just sort of comment I'd offer or that just mm -hmm. makes me think about is that um, you know, Andrew mentioned that, I mean, we understand that in this COVID-19 pandemic situation, that sort of immediate short-term relief efforts are needed and that churches have an opportunity to step into that kind of work. And so we wanna honor that. And at the same time, I think I would, for any grant application, we would encourage you to think through how being a part of those relief efforts could also help you develop you know, new relationships with new people in your community and and how um, those relief efforts could be a part of a larger um, effort on your part uh, to do that kind of again sort of relational deep uh, kind of work so just just a, a reflection about that idea thank you okay so i have just a quick question and a thought. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming these are like one-time grants. I'm kind of uh, assuming that's a, a one-time thing. Um, um, and I, as I'm thinking about that, because, uh, you know, um, as part of either an initiative or um, either contributing to something on, a, you know, maybe once or twice, and just in, in all consideration, looking at the size of the grant, you're not talking about something that's going to sustain something necessarily long-term. Um, so that's one assumption. The other thing, other question I had actually is that um, the thing that came to my mind was um, our day school is right now providing um, care from Monday to Thursday for children for essential workers. Um, it's kind of a different program from what they normally do and they are also helping them with their schoolwork and all of that. So I don't know if this is something that could possibly we could look at into, you know, either an underserved community that where they're still needing that kind of assistance, you know, it, it, would it be appropriate for something like that is actually, is actually my question. Um, so th that's what I was just wondering. Okay. So I guess, thanks Lucretia. Um, with regard to the um, daycare question, I would say, uh, I would encourage you to connect with Andrew for some richer conversation about that. Okay. Uh, that That's not um, an idea that just we've already talked about. And so I think we probably just need to have more conversation to okay. understand that opportunity. A little more and what that would look like in terms okay. of a grant but um yeah for these for these grants in fact most of the granting work that our center does um they're they're meant to be sort of one-time catalytic grants that help you um, launch something or start something um as you can imagine um you know our as a conference um you know, I mean, we have funds that we like to, I mean, obviously we would like to redirect and put back into the hands of local church leadership, uh, but our funds are limited. And so if we got into the business of um, sustaining a lot of local church ministries, then we'd only be able to help, you know, four or five churches at one time. <laughs> um, but if we play a more catalytic role, then I think it, the idea is that we can come alongside and help spark creative work in, I mean, School, 20, 40, 50 churches all at one time. And, um, and also hopefully 
um, then that will encourage investment and ownership um, from the lady in your church so that the sustainability of that depends then upon um, your local church leadership uh, grabbing hold of the vision and then um, I mean you know like a lot of our ministries developing uh, such a commitment to it that uh, once it's launched then they um, are invested and want to continue to see it they want to see it continue so anyway just that's a little bit of our thought process about the grants. I have a question. Great. Andy, so for the, uh, the man matching grant, do we have to have secured all of the funds prior to applying for the matching grant? Uh, no, not prior to applying. So, um, and, and, uh, and this is a, a little nuance that at least Andrew and I haven't talked about. Um, but if you want to apply for a matching grant, in your grant, if you can describe either the money that you uh, that you believe you can get or the process by which you will raise those funds, um, then we can consider the application um, with that in mind. Um, but then I do think, and this is the part, this is the nuance we'll have to work out, is at what point a check from a conference is released. And, and can that be a rolling process as well? So like if you say, you know, we have a goal of raising $1,000. At whatever point you raise 500, then maybe you let us know that and then we can release the check for 500. When you get to the full amount, we can release the full amount, right? So we wanna, I think we'll work with you. I think the, again, for us, the value is for us to be as responsive as we can and to, um, to put these grant dollars to use in your contexts as quickly as we can and do that responsibly, obviously. So, um, so yeah, the, the money doesn't have to be in hand before you apply. Good question. Thank you. You're helping us think about little details that we haven't talked about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if there, if there are not other questions at this point, then, um, we thought that uh, a good use of maybe the remainder of our time um, would be, Andrew, for you to put us into a couple of uh, smaller groups where we could maybe talk with each other and share, uh, share ideas that either that we've thought about or even just name needs that we're seeing in our communities and we can help one another in the early stage of um, envisioning these ministries uh, for which a grant could uh, be given. So, um, so I think our plan is, uh, Andrew, will divide us into a couple of breakout groups and um, we can facilitate that conversation. And then after, uh, what do you say, 20 minutes maybe, 15 minutes, Andrew, you can judge based on how it's going in your group. Then um, we'll come back together just for a brief wrap up. Okay, sound good?